Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Prasad and I'm a psychiatrist based in London. And I'm in conversation today with Michael Ferguson, who's on the board of the Journal of Homosexuality and writes on cultural history and sexual matters. And he's written a very interesting book review, uh, a book review essay on Alan Turing, who lived between 1912 and 1954, where he's reviewed two of the key biographies of uh, this important mathematician and computer scientist. And let me start by asking you, uh, Michael, why were you interested in Alan Turing? Why is he an important figure uh, to us even today? Well, I write for the Journal of Homosexuality, and um, uh, Alan Turing, uh, it was well known, uh, was uh, homosexual, and he was uh, persecuted by the British government for this, and uh, this, I think, was one of the things that led to his uh, unfortunate suicide, and so the relationship between the official legal persecution of homosexuality and the, how should I say, the, the damage or the destruction that it causes to society is um, epitomized by this case. Because here was a man who had enormous ability, who was creative, and who was <coughs> very important in the British war effort. He was instrumental in breaking the German codes that enabled the British to win the Second World War. Yet he was persecuted for a matter in his private life, destroyed as a person, and ended up dying uh, of his own volition. And this is a, a great loss to society, and it's, it's a senseless waste. And so this case um, exemplifies what is wrong with the official um, persecution of homosexual behavior. And in fact, um, Alan Turing has been in the news again very recently because at the turn of the year uh, it was announced that he'd received an official royal pardon, albeit posthumously, um, for uh, the crime that he was supposed to have committed uh, back in the 1950s. And this has raised a controversy here in the United Kingdom, which is why should Alan Turing be pardoned, perhaps because he was an eminent uh, genius, and all the other homosexual men who suffered at the hands of the law at the time have not been pardoned. I wondered if you, if you had any thoughts about that. In my opinion, they should all be pardoned. <clears throat> if you're going to pardon Alan Turing for homosexuality, it's um, it's a repudiation of the policy that was in force at that time, uh, and you know Alan Turing's persecution came at the same time that a very similar thing was going on in the United States under uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. Uh, it was in the early 1950s, and the British government and the United States government were trying to cleanse their ranks of homosexuals and many people on both sides of the Atlantic were fired or in some cases imprisoned for this and by pardoning Alan Turing uh, it seems to me that the British government is saying that that this policy was mistaken and we hereby uh, rescinded and repudiated, and uh, if they're going to do that for Alan Turing, why not do it for all of the people that were uh, prosecuted under those laws? Now, the story of Alan Turing, particularly perhaps the story of how um, his life tragically ended, um, is very well told in your book review, but also, as you draw out in your book review, has something to do with his character. And his character is linked to his approach to mathematics and computer science, and the fact that he was someone who stood apart from the crowd and persisted in doing so. And this may be partly what got him into trouble with the authorities as well, besides obviously his homosexuality. So let's talk a little bit about his personality, because you draw out his personality in your book review, and you're kind of arguing this is important in understanding his contribution as a mathematician and a cryptographer as well. Yes, his personality. Um... 
there's a lot that is not known that I wish were known about his inner life. Uh, Alan Turing did not write poetry. He didn't write novels. He didn't paint. He did mathematics. And mathematics is a field that is completely devoid of emotion and personal self-expression. It's true that mathematicians have interests uh, that you know uh, reflect their personalities, but mathematics itself is is devoid of sentiment. And I think that's one of the things that attracted him to it. In fact, uh, many mathematicians, I think, are drawn to it for that reason because it is so unemotional and impersonal, and it's just a matter of formal proof, truth, and falsehood without any of the uh, complications and ambiguities that the personal life brings to it. And so I think that was one of the appeals for Alan Turing um, to uh, mathematics. And cryptography is a little bit different because cryptography has to do with the inaccessibility of communication. It's the attempt to to unmask communication that is intended to remain secret. It's an attempt to to get past barriers to communication. And I think that that might also have been uh, a part of Alan Turing's psychology. Um, he had many friendships and he was certainly I mean he was a little bit socially awkward and there were a lot of peculiarities in his behavior but he was um, he was certainly functional and um, uh, he could express himself and he was known um, uh, for being very direct and for being mm, sometimes kind of blunt and um, you know, he, he always felt like an outsider. He never, um, um, mm, he, 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 in contrast, I mean, uh, there's a place in Hodge's book that I was looking at the other day where he contrasts Alan Turing to John von Neumann. John von Neumann was another mathematician and physicist, and John von Neumann was very social. He, John von Neumann got into all the committees he was uh, a very effective uh, lobbyist and, uh, and, and leader um, in the scientific community, whereas Turing was much more isolated um, uh, individual, uh, idiosyncratic. Um, and this, mm, this kept, I think he had a, a deep sense of estrangement, and it might have been also related to the uh, homosexuality and the fact that that it was so unacceptable um, in the mainstream of society. So um, yeah, I think those are all factors uh, in Turing's interests and in and his attitude towards society and the institutional um, uh, bureaucracy that he had to live in. That's a very interesting link that you're drawing with maybe his difficulties in understanding people or understanding social life and his interest in cryptography, which is about decoding or getting behind um, uh, communication. <clears throat> if we just focus a little bit on his cryptography and his contribution as a direct result of his work, it is said that the Second World War was maybe shortened by two years and he kind of saved the United Kingdom. Could you say a little bit about that, about his contribution in terms of of, uh, uh, of his cryptography? You know, this is uh, an area where I am not uh, an expert and um, it's an area that I found the most dense and most difficult in reading the uh, biography. He he was interested in, in creating these machines that would break down codes and, uh, and encryption. And these, uh, um, I, 
I found them very, very difficult to understand. I would like to see one sometime and just see how they work. But you know, Turing had an interest in machines from a very early age. Uh, he was interested in uh, the possibility of creating machines that could think, and he was interested in the nature of thought and what it was and um, uh, how what what was intelligence and um, he had all these kinds of interests, and this uh, applied very much to cryptography and to creating these machines that could analyze and break down coded messages. Uh, how that all worked, uh, you know, I'm really the wrong person to ask about all that because that's um, it's it's outside my uh, area of um, expertise and. Actually, I mean, my interest in Alan Turing is also outside of this. I'm interested in him more uh, in his personal life and uh, in his work on the philosophy of mathematics. But I think it is true to say that um, his major contributions to the to the to computing and the notions of artificial intelligence continue uh, to shape our world today. So there was an enormous contribution he made, but his life was tragically cut short. Now the circumstances that lead up to that are are, are very um, enigmatic and interesting. He was found dead having bitten into an apple that was meant to be laced with cyanide. And there's controversy as to whether that was a suicide or, as some people have suggested, whether it was an assassination disguised as a suicide. Um, now, you come down quite firmly on the side that it was suicide. Could you say a bit about why? It wasn't a controversy to the medical examiner. Um, they, when they uh, did the examination of his body, they concluded that he had died of cyanide poisoning. There was an apple there. They didn't test the apple. So we don't know whether there was cyanide in the apple or not, but there was cyanide in his house. And the thing that I think is um, decisive about it being a suicide is the fact that he had recently gone through this arrest and uh, this hormone treatment or uh, I guess you would call it chemical castration uh, for homosexuality. Uh, the, um, the drugs that he had to take um, altered his body, uh, it caused him to develop breasts, they supposedly um, made him impotent, uh, they altered his uh, sex drive, and I think that this had a really devastating impact on his outlook and on his conception of himself. Uh, he, he wasn't that old, he was only about 40 one maybe getting close to his 42nd birthday at the time of his death that's not that old and um, sexuality is a very important part of a person's life and um, it has a lot to do with one's self-esteem and uh, and one's hope for the future and by destroying that I think they they intensified uh, um, something that was already there and had been for a long time, namely an underlying sense of despair and pessimism about human relations. Um, and that's evident going way, way back. Uh, I noticed um, that uh, when Alan Turing was in school, he was fond of a passage from the Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which is a book that was published in the 17th century uh, uh, by John Bunyan, and it was uh, about the great despair and um, about uh, the, the Christian being um, taken into a, a dungeon and, and severely beaten. And um, uh, 
This was Alan Turing's uh, favorite passage from that book when he was about 13 years old. So I think that this, this sense of despair about human relations and about uh, connection to other people was something uh, that was problematic in his life for a very long time. And I think with the um, arrest and the chemical castration, I think that intensified it. That kind of pushed him over the edge because this interest in poisoning by an apple, that had that was um, there for a very long time. That had, uh, uh, since I think in the 1930s when he saw that Walt Disney movie about uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and he was interested in... Uh, uh, you know the witch dipping the uh, apple in the poison brew and all that. Um, those ideas had been rolling around in his head for a very long time, and I think one of the things that, well, a couple things, kept that despair and depression in check was the rewards that he got. Uh, both intellectual and social for being part of the British government's war effort and uh, for helping to break the German code. Uh, he was um, you know, seen as uh, uh, kind of a hero. And also his sex life, which we don't know much about, uh, but we do know that he had one. And when the British government turned on him and, and destroyed both his uh, reputation as one who could work in the British government and be instrumental in um, uh, you know furthering the uh, the power and the um, uh, stability of the British government and also in destroying his own personal sex life I think that was enough that uh, that allowed that despair to um, uh, to resurge and uh, ultimately, I mean, you only have to commit suicide once, so uh, that's all it took, and uh, that was, uh, I think, what did it. It was that combination of uh, uh, the persecution of the homosexuality, um, the revoking of his um, clearances security clearances in the British government on top of a a basic uh, tendency toward despair and pessimism that was already in place for a long time. And I think one of the things that's really impressive about your book review is your attempt to get a nuanced view of what his mental state was like at the end, as opposed to the, the sort of tabloid press view, which was like his life was a descent into madness. Um, if, we, if we just pick up the events as they occurred, because they are fascinating and obviously tragic as well. So he had a lover who returned to Turing's home and broke in and bur burglarized his place. I don't think and it was the lover. It was a friend of the lover, as I ah, understand it. Okay. It was somebody that... Uh, see, this, this was a kid who was 19. Right. Turing was 39. And um, the way I understand the story, it was one of his... one of the, the lover's companions that broke in. Okay. Maybe that was the story, but that's the way I, I understood it. So then the police, the, the police get involved, Turing reports right. it to the police, the police turn up and decide instead of pursuing the burglary to pursue Turing because they they work out he's homosexual and he is very open about it, perhaps naively right. so. Yeah. Well, he, he wasn't, you know, uh, he wasn't at all shy about it. Or uh, you know he didn't make any effort to conceal it. I mean he didn't flaunt it either. Uh, it was just something that was part of him. You know I think, and being in the United States, I think that there was some difference, uh, perhaps between the the British attitude and the American on this. But I think in in certain circles in England, uh, homosexuality has been accepted and taken for granted for a long time, uh, much more so than it has in the United States. Um, 
uh, particularly among some of the uh, aristocracy and in some of those uh, public schools that are sexually segregated. Um, and Alan Turing grew up in that milieu, and I think he just kind of took that for granted. And I think probably a lot of the people around him might have also, uh, but the wider society uh, did not. And um, that's, you know, since he kind of lived a, an isolated life, a kind of, uh, he was sort of indifferent to the mainstream of society. Um, I don't think he realized what, what he was up against when, when this occurred. And the other interesting thing is the anecdote you put in your um, uh, book reviews about the fact that he was in psychoanalysis at the time, which was much more fashionable perhaps then as the standard approach to psychological problems than it might be today. But the other fascinating insight into what life was like back in the 50s is he goes on a, a walking seaside um, uh, tour, as it were, with his psychoanalyst and their family, they come across a gypsy's caravan who's a fortune teller. Turing goes inside and spends half an hour, which is a long time to spend with a fortune teller, and it is said comes out sort of ashen white. So you, you pick up on that as maybe a, a signal that something wasn't quite right with Turing at the time, drawing towards the end. Nobody knows what was said in that encounter. Uh, nobody knows what that uh, psychic told him. And uh, we don't really know what, what he made of it either. Uh, they, this was a report. They said that, uh, you know, that he, he looked pale, he looked ashen, he was crestfallen. But so what? I mean, what does that mean? What uh, did it say? Um, you know, that's all speculation. Uh, people say that he was going mad. Well, what's, ma what's, what's madness? You know, wh what are they talking about? You could say, well, anybody who kills himself must be mad. Oh, okay. But that that's, doesn't really explain what happened. That's not a, an in-depth understanding of the person. I agree. And another clue is that he kept some dream diaries, as people in psychoanalysis are often encouraged to, because psychoanalysts are very interested in, in people's dreams. Uh, modern psychiatry is much less interested. Perhaps we've lost something there. But um, he kept some dream diaries, and the psychoanalyst, before destroying them, let his brother have a look at them. And his brother seems to have come to the conclusion um, that, that maybe um, Ch Turing was troubled in some way. Uh, that's, yeah, that's in Hodges, um, and, um, of course, we don't know what those books said. I really wish they hadn't destroyed them, but, um, yeah, according, uh, to the report, the brother, um, uh, was, you know, rather taken aback with what he saw there. It supposedly contained a lot about, uh, his sex life from adolescence on. And uh, he, I believe it said something to the effect of horrific comments about his mother. Uh, so apparently the relationship with the mother uh, left a lot to be desired, which would be consistent with an underlying uh, sense of despair and depression. And so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, but, you know, we can't, you can't really say anything about it because Mm, it's it's a tantalizing clue, but um, I don't really want to infer much beyond you know just those reports. Uh, we can't we can't we because we don't know what was in them. We don't know what the dreams were, and uh, you know we don't know what the brother saw. So that's that's a dead end. I want to pick up um, as we, as we draw to a conclusion about the fact that one of the things you write about very evocatively in your uh, book review, in, published in the Journal of Homosexuality, is the notion of difference. That mathematicians are a bit different from the rest of us, but even within the world of mathematics, Turing himself was a bit different from from other mathematicians. For example, you draw the example in terms of Turing had a 
maybe a, a minority view on this thing called the Riemann hypothesis, which is about the pattern of prime numbers. Right. And obviously, Turing was different in terms of being homosexual at the time. I wonder if you could just pick up on that point of Turing being different, and maybe the fact that he's different, you know, was was something that became problematic, but also the fact that he thought differently about the world and was brave intellectually was part of the reason he could make such a massive contribution. Uh, you know, Alan Turing had great self-confidence in his intellect and in his ability to solve problems. And I think that this... Um, mm, it, you know, especially in mathematics, because mathematics, you know, is not something where that depends on consensus. It doesn't depend on uh, on other people agreeing with you or anything. It only depends on your ability to prove something or not prove it. Uh, it's uh, it's completely devoid of sentiment, and. Um, so Turing, I think that that gave him an indifference to what other people might think about a particular issue, particularly in mathematics, because in mathematics, you know, and and this has happened many times, the majority has been proven wrong, uh, and and Turing was one of the ones who did that with the um, decidability problem and the incompleteness. Uh, that was something that all the mathematicians thought, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century that they thought that that would uh, turn out to be true and um, uh, Turing and Gödel and uh, Church and a few others uh, you know set them straight and um, uh, I think Turing liked to show them up I think he uh, he liked um, you know sort of mm, tearing down these uh, uh, False icons, you might say, things that uh, people believe that that are not justified, that are not uh, proven, and I think that that was also related to this bias against homosexuality that he saw uh, prevailing in society, and uh, he himself saw absolutely nothing wrong with it. So it was uh, iconoclasm, and it was uh, you know a real just a, a deep-seated uh, confidence in himself, uh, in, his, um, in his intellectual abilities, uh, that gave him this indifference to uh, what the rest of the mathematics world might have uh, thought. And he was willing to you know, pursue his own star in these things. Uh, and... Uh, you know, a lot of times that's how uh, how innovations come about and how uh, revolutions start. Is this one, you know, anomalous person, somebody who uh, you know just won't go along, and then they somehow they stumble onto something that uh, changes everything. We like to think that we live in more enlightened times than the 1950s, and we like to think that we don't persecute people for things like their sexuality anymore. Do you think there's still lessons to be learned um, from the Alan Turing story for today? Well, we do persecute people for their sexuality. Um, there's a, a, a vicious uh, campaign going on against uh, child pornography, for example, and people who have uh, sexual relations with young people, uh, the governments, uh, I think mainly in the United States, uh, and the United States has promoted this around the world, that um, uh, children uh, should not have sex, or that sex somehow damages children, that's something that they should be kept away from, which is really a ridiculous idea when you think about it. And it's very, very similar in character to the persecution of homosexuality that went on in the, um, well, through most of the 20th century in the United States. And it's going on now at, uh, every day in the paper. You see uh, people being arrested and uh, persecuted and locked up for long periods of time over, uh, you know, relationships that were 
consensual and um, uh, uh, harmless until they were discovered. So uh, we still persecute people for sex, and um, yeah, there's um, uh, commercial sex is still outlawed in uh, 49 out of 50 states here, and um, this drives it into the hands of criminals. It uh, it creates a whole illicit market in trafficking and. Uh, it becomes related to drugs and weapons and everything, all kinds of mm, sordid and unseemly things result from an official persecution of private sexual behavior. So there are lessons uh, from Alan Turing's case, and uh, we should take note of them and um, consider them. Michael Ferguson, thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed it. Thank you.